Hello, wildlings. I'm your creep smith, and you found my fear forge. <laughs> Lucky you. Hey, wildlings. It's safe to say that if you come across something that requires an iceberg video to describe, it's a good chance that you'll be finding connections that you hadn't seen before. This applies to movies, games, and horror fiction as well. We've experienced this before in the Fleshgate series, and here it opens up again in tonight's deep dive into darkness, Butcherface, Part 5, by Dash 32. And yes, this one will be long. Sorry for the long wait. This is the rest of the story up until now. Just like the past parts, this will also be long. It was just two days after Jesse crashed into the tree claiming Butcherface was in his back seat that Butcherface came back. I'd finally found a job and due to having some insomnia and a screwed up sleeping schedule, I decided to take a sleeping pill so that I could fall asleep at a decent time and get a good amount in my first day. I still don't know what caused it, but I was all of a sudden jolted awake at four in the morning. I reached up to rub my face, and my arm felt sticky. It took me a second to realize this, and by that time, I had touched my face and felt that it was sticky too. My first thought was that I was bleeding, and immediately I turned the light on and looked at my arm. It was paint. My entire body was covered in paint. Multiple colors with thick black lines dividing them into small random shapes uh, similar to a stained glass window. I always sleep covered in a blanket, and tonight someone had pulled it aside, leaving me uncovered. I jumped out of bed and noticed that the bed itself was also completely smeared with paint. There was uh, also a number of drops on the floor next to my bed where the paint cans appear to have been placed. Uh, I ran into the bathroom down the hall and looked in the mirror. The, the paint truly was covering every inch of my uncovered body. And since I was only sleeping in a pair of boxers that night, the majority of my body was painted. Looking at my head, I parted my hair. It was matted and stuck to my head and found the CV symbol painted in dark red on my forehead. I jumped in the shower to wash it off, fearing that it might contain lead and I might get lead poisoning. That probably sounds pretty stupid, fearing that I'd get lead poisoning after just having it on me for a short amount of time, but I was freaked out. After washing myself off, I went to tell Chris about what had happened and found the front door wide open. Now, it was 4 a.m., it was still dark out and it was raining the computer in the living room was also on. Neither of us had used that computer for months. All of the lights were off, and the computer was open to a Word document, giving the room a white glow. I closed and locked the door, and then went to turn off the computer when I noticed what I guess you'd call a small poem written on the otherwise empty document, which I'll read for you here. Um, the text went... The pit is fed, find the key in your head, follow me. The next couple months seemed to slow down. Emma and I had been seeing much more of each other. We had really become best friends. More than that even. She's a really big movie fan, like me, and we began having weekly movie nights. Chris's ex began hanging out with us again, though they still weren't back together. Their relationship was complicated. At some point, they had found her camera behind Chris's nightstand. Chris claimed that he had no clue how it got there. The two of us finally got started working on the other properties that our landlord owned. It was part of our agreement for the house. That wasn't too bad. Some of the houses were still empty and we had the keys, so I kind of found it fun. One dark moment during this time was when Chris's father was arrested for drunk driving. 
Chris and I drove down to the police station to bail him out. The whole drive home, he just kept apologizing to Chris for moving into his family's house, which started these butcher face problems. He passed out at one point, and when he woke up, he told a story about the night before when he was sitting at home watching television when he started to hear noises in the basement. The basement where Chris used to live and was now empty. He grabbed his hunting rifle and went down the stairs. When he got down there, he realized that the sounds were coming from underneath the floorboards where we had initially found the butcher face tapes. He actually shot two rounds into the floor and then ran outside around the house into the backyard and found some cinder blocks missing from the wall that led to the hole underneath the basement. The next weekend, me, Chris, and his ex visited Jesse. Emma was too busy with a family function at the time. Uh, Jesse had a decent loft in the city, living with a bunch of other artists that he used to go to college with, and we actually hadn't gotten around to seeing that just yet. Well, while there, hanging out before the movie we were going to see, he began showing us the art projects that he'd been working on. He'd molded some Batman cowls, which I found pretty cool, being a huge Batman fan, uh, some random sculptures, and some paintings. I'd heard that he had created a Bane mask from scratch, and I asked to see it. He pulled it out of his desk drawer and showed it off. Oh, as you think darkness is your ally. <laughs> when he was done and putting it back in the drawer, I noticed something brown in the drawer behind it and pulled that out. It was a mask made of burlap. He said it wasn't what we thought. He had made the mask based on the story that we told him. He just did it for the fun of it. He even held up his hands and said, You said he was missing some fingers. Look, I have all of mine, and I'd have to be about 20 years older than I am. He obviously knew that that's not what we were thinking. We were afraid that he was becoming obsessed. We left without ever seeing the movie. Me and Chris played burglar again the next Saturday night and staked out Jesse's place, but he never left. A couple of days later, I came home from work to find Chris and his ex standing in our front yard. When I got out of the car, Chris's ex walked up to me looking agitated, holding up something in her hand and saying, Is this yours? I looked at it and realized that it was a hidden camera. It was a lens attached to a wire that led to a small black box. I said no and asked where they found it. She said she'd found it taped under a low shelf in the TV stand in their living room and added, along with these and held up four more small cameras. We went inside and continued looking for more. Ultimately, we found 16 of them around the house, in closets, between the fridge and the cabinet, under low shelves, three of them taped under the kitchen table, in the shadow of a shelf on my desk, and one behind my nightstand, facing my pillow. We did a little investigating, and those types of cameras can only transmit their signal within a small, few hundred foot radius. Now, we're still paranoid about whether our phones are bugged or not. So we call our landlord, and he comes right down. We asked him outright if he put the cameras there, and he strongly denied it, and even said that he'd set up a meeting with his lawyer for help if we found out who actually did it even said that he was now paranoid and was going home to see if there were any cameras hidden in his house. That weekend, Chris and I visited his ex at her house. I talked her into seeing the butcher face pictures she found on her camera again. She handed it to me and I walked outside into her front yard, started flipping through the pictures. I stood next to her driveway and stopped at the picture of her car in her driveway. I then flipped to the next picture of the window, walked down her driveway to the road and looked both ways, saw the same window in the picture to my left, down the road. I told him to get in the car and drive in the direction of that house. We grabbed some flashlights because we didn't know how long we'd be gone and it was late in the day, and jumped in the car and started driving. 
past the house with the window in the picture. We kept driving for about 45 minutes until we came across the Apple store, seen in the very next picture on the camera. After another 15 to 20 minutes of driving, we came across the old house, seen in the pictures. It was at the end of a long driveway and partially hidden by some trees, but we found it. We got out of the car and that's when I told them what I suspected. The pictures were deliberately left on her camera to lead us to this house. We walked the length of the driveway. At this point, the sun had just set below the horizon and it was getting dark fast. With the trees over our heads, it was even darker and eerily quiet. The feeling of being watched was almost enough for me to just say nope, spin around, and run back to the car. We got to the door and noticed a latch for a padlock was on the door. The padlock itself was found in the overgrown bushes near there with the lock out. Chris's ex said that we should stop and go home, but both me and Chris said that we'd gone this far and we were way too curious to just turn back now. I turned the knob and pushed, but the door seemed to be stuck. I gave it a shove and it flew open. The first thing that hit us was that the place stank. A waft of the foulest stink that I'd ever smelled just blew right into our faces the second the door was opened. It was also pretty dark, so we pulled out our flashlights and walked inside. We immediately recognized stuff from the pictures. Uh, the old reclining chair with the axe was to our left, but the axe was missing. And the collapsed corner of the roof was in the far end of the room. A dead cat sat on the floor a few feet away from the chair in the middle of the room. It was on its back and it had been flayed with the skin stretched open and most of the organs missing. It smelled bad. It was also covered with footprints as if the people living there had just been walking over it like they didn't even care it was there. To the right of the door was the table that we saw in the pictures. It was completely covered with melted candle wax. On the same side of the room next to the door behind us was a bookcase. I pulled a random book out and flipped through the pages. They were completely full of drawings and writings. The text was actually written over with new writings. One thing scribbled across the page that stuck out to me was I became insane with long intervals of horrible sanity. We then walked into the kitchen, which was through a door behind the table. There was an old fridge off to the side with about 15 knives stabbed into the door. Chris's ex opened it and found it dead and completely full of mold. A large glass jar sat on the counter full of used syringes. The kitchen cabinet's wooden doors had been torn off and laid off to the side. They were covered with random carvings of faces, words, and a lot of CV symbols. Chris opened a door and found a flight of stairs that led down into a dark basement. We walked down the flight of stairs and found the basement in the picture. The picture had in it what appeared to be animal skins hanging from the ceiling, but those skins were apparently now gone. The floor was dirt, but it seemed to be packed down, like when you spray loose dirt with water. There was a patch of loose dirt off to one side. We dug into it and found old video cameras, still cameras, cell phones, voice recorders, and dry pans. It was like some sort of technological mass grave. We then continued searching the room. There was a door in the far wall and we walked over to it. I opened it and was shocked to find what appeared to be hundreds of monstrous faces looking at us. All three of us jumped back and Chris's ex let out a scream. When we looked again, we realized that they were just masks. A whole wall covered in paper mache masks just like the one we'd seen false face wearing in the pictures. They were all ornately painted, each one a different design. We thought about taking one as a souvenir but decided against it fearing that they might realize one was missing and come looking for it. We then climbed back up the stairs and went through the nearby back door into the backyard. It was full of holes dug into the ground. We acknowledged the snap branch seen in the pictures, then moved on to the large barn. On our way, we could just barely notice that there seemed to be an extensive backyard behind the barn, 
And if we didn't find anything interesting inside, well, we would check that out next. As soon as we opened the door, blinding light hit our faces and it was like we were walking into a case of deja vu. The inside of the barn immediately looked familiar. There had been some drastic changes, but we recognized it instantly as the barn that Butcherface killed the pig with an axe in, in the original tapes we'd found. But like I said, there were many changes. For one thing, large lights had been set up on the beams close to the ceiling, brightly lighting the entire room, which was a drastic change from the normally dark butcher face media. In the center of the room, there was a strange sculpture made of brick and mortar that resembled a large shriveled tree or an upside down bolt of lightning. It stood roughly 15 feet into the air with the, what I guess you'd call branches, nearly touching the beams high above us. Hanging from those branches on a foot of twine were what looked like hundreds of pieces of old yellowed paper, each with a different grotesque face painted or drawn on it. The beams and walls were covered with drawings, paintings, and carvings of evil faces and symbols. There seemed to be a pattern to it because they all seemed to lead to what I guess would be a shrine on the opposite wall to the door. A tall wooden crate sat there, covered in carvings of the CV symbol over and over again, sitting on top of what was an orange blown glass sculpture in the shape of fire. And sitting in front of that was a smaller box, completely free of any carvings or other media. I had the strongest feeling that the pictures were left on Chris's ex's camera because we were supposed to see what was inside that box. We were led here for that reason. It did fit the darkly theatrical style of butcher face. Could what's inside the box be the key mentioned in the poem that I found on the computer? I reached out to open the box, but Chris's ex grabbed my hand and told me not to touch it. She didn't want to know what was in it. We had a fight and decided, eventually, to leave the box alone. But Chris noticed another crate on its side, in the shadows in the corner of the far wall of the room. Sitting on the far end of it, facing away from us, was something that was emitting a faint glow on the opposite wall. We walked over and realized it was a laptop. Walking around the crate, we got a look at what was on the screen and were shocked at what we saw. It was a Butcherface website. Now, it obviously didn't say Butcherface on it since that was our name that we'd come up with, but the whole page was covered in the type of media that we'd seen before. Drawings, writings, pictures, videos. There were CGI models of the demonic creatures that occasionally show up in his drawings. Hundreds of pictures of dead animals and pictures of homemade tools and weapons. One thing that creeped us out was a series of pictures of different people wearing masks with multiple designs and made of different materials. A long tirade was on one page about people needing to open their eyes and saying that he has the resources to do that. It continued saying that he was a warrior fighting for the pit and that he'll soon succeed. Towards the end of it, he said something about finally receiving the causa from the vexillum or vexillium, I can't quite remember, and ended with, oh my delayed joy. There were comments below it by people saying that it was brilliant and beautiful. I mean, there were pages after pages of this. One picture that surprised us was of a person lying face down on the ground, covered in blood, and in the foreground was an arm holding a ball-peen hammer with a light film of blood on it. The strange thing about the hammer was that both ends of the handle had a hammer head on it. So apparently, he is willing to kill. We'd never seen any evidence of this before. Chris said he'd never even heard of it either in all of his research and wondered what were the circumstances that would be needed for Butcherface to kill. Regrettably, I can't remember the website address because it was just a very long series of numbers. After a while, I stood up and continued looking around the barn. I went back to looking at the carvings on the walls and noticed a hatchet list. 
I glanced over at Chris and his ex and noticed how close they seemed to be. They were ear to ear looking at the computer screen, talking about what they were seeing, finishing each other's sentences. It's like they were working together again. I admittedly found that a bit perverse with them rebonding under these circumstances while in the very house of Butcherface itself. I cleared my throat to get their attention and jokingly asked if I was interrupting anything. At that moment, just as I was about to point out the hatch in the floor, a loud crash echoed throughout the barn, shaking the walls and causing the lights to flicker. Chris jumped up, ran past me, and slammed the barn door shut. We ran up behind him and asked if he saw anything to which he said he didn't. Another crash shook the barn. It was like somebody was throwing boulders against the walls or something. Another crash hit the door, pushing it in, but it stayed locked, knocking up to the floor. We jumped back up and Chris said, Don't worry, as long as we're in here, we'll be okay. That was met with another crash, and the lights flickered out, throwing us into complete darkness. The three of us stood still, listening. I put my arms out to feel for anything. All I needed was to walk into a beam and get a bloody nose. Everything seemed very quiet, and my eyes couldn't seem to adjust to the darkness. After a few seconds of complete silence, Chris's ex whispered, Do you hear anything? That was answered with another deafening crash. I had to cover my ears because it was so loud, like lightning striking the barn. As the echoes faded away, Chris whispered for her to be quiet. We stood completely still, not daring to make a sound. We were absolutely, completely panicking. I was wondering if there was more than one person outside. That's when I began to hear a slow creaking coming from the darkness. I whispered, did you hear that? And the creaking stopped. Going against my instincts, I took a deep breath and quietly said, Hello? But I didn't get an answer. Then I began to hear a low breathing coming from deeper in the pitch black barn, and it seemed to be moving. My mind flashed to the hatch in the floor that I'd seen earlier, and I realized the creaking was coming from that direction. Somebody else had opened the hatch and was now in the barn with us. With the flash of the hatch in my mind's eye, I began to map out the barn with my memory. I now knew that the nearest beam would be far to our left and that we should be in the open part of the barn with the door behind us and Chris and his ex still seeming to be behind me, closer to the door. The brick tree would be about 15 feet in front of me and slightly off to the left. Understanding the layout and knowing there were no obstructions in front of me, I decided to quietly feel my way to the hatch. I reached out my arms again, and they hit a body. I let out a yell, turned and yelled, RUN! and followed my own instructions. I pushed past Chris and his ex, threw the doors open, and yelled, COME ON! We booked it out of there, past the old house, up the driveway, jumped into the car, and tore out of there. During the drive, we started asking questions. We realized that this was bigger than we'd thought. We wondered how he was getting all of these gadgets, and how could he get in and out of locked locations so easily. We started wondering who the people in the pictures were. Were they followers, or were they members of a group that Butcherface was also a member of? What if Butcherface was the follower of somebody even higher, and if so, Well, this group had to have a name. Following the event, I just wanted to have a stress-free environment for a little while. I did everything just short of having a bubble bath. I called Emma, asked her to come over that weekend. This was two weeks ago. When the weekend came, she arrived and apparently expected to have another movie night, but I didn't want to have anything to do with anything connected to that kind of Although I obviously didn't tell her this, Uh, besides, I had different plans. So just as the sun was setting, we jumped into my car and drove down the road and turned onto the dirt road that I mentioned in part four, just drove to the old building that we'd discovered. I'd found it really interesting and wanted to go back, I just never had the time or any reason to. 
I parked in front of it and pulled a blanket out of the back of the car, and we made our way inside. I brought her up to the second floor and showed her the hole in the ceiling, then laid the blanket down underneath it, and we laid on it, looking up at the stars. We stayed there for about three hours, just talking. After a while, a light rumble began from outside. I stood up and looked through the hole outside. I had just enough of a view to realize that the rumbling was coming from the dirt road outside. Then an old rusted truck came through the trees, revealing the source of the sound. It stopped behind my car, and someone stepped out of the driver's seat. It was too dark at this point to make them out. They were just like a dark silhouette. The figure then walked up to my car and started looking through the windows. I don't mean just glancing in. They were leaning against the car, peering into it. The person then tried to open the driver's door. I yelled, Hey! And the dark shape looked right at me, keeping its gaze on me, pulled something out of its pocket, and smashed the window. I instinctually jumped up and ran down the stairs, Emma following me. Getting outside, I ran toward him, yelling, What the hell are you doing to my car? Going completely against what I expected that he would do, he began running at me full speed. He held the object in his hand over his head like a weapon and began emitting a loud growl. As he continued to barrel down toward me, I began to get a better idea of what he looked like. It was still too dark, and he still looked like a black shape, but it was right then that I could see his outline, and I realized that he was wearing a mask. I immediately skidded to a stop, spun around, and began running in the opposite direction. I grabbed Emma, and we ran around the old building that we had previously been in, and ran into the woods in the direction of our house. There was just enough star and moonlight to see where we were going. I looked back, but I couldn't see if he was still behind us. There were too many trees to be able to tell, and the sound of our running and our heavy breathing was canceling out any chance of hearing the loud growling he was making. Amazingly, we actually made it back to our backyard and ran into the back door, which goes into the basement. I pushed the door open, let Emma in, and jumped in behind her. I flipped the light switch near the door, wanting to avoid the trash in there, and was horrified by what I saw. All of the trash had been pushed up against the walls. Some of it was arranged into strange shapes. A row of paint cans that happened to be the same colors that were painted on me almost four months earlier were lined up on the floor near the stairs. Some of the softer trash had been made into a pile on the far wall and had an impression in it like someone had been lying on it. Butcher Face had been living in our basement. I locked the door, ran up the stairs, and called Chris. His ex was there too. She apparently came over after me and Emma left. I brought them downstairs and asked him if there was any chance that he had done this. He looked shocked and said that he'd only been down there with me that one time, and we hadn't touched anything. I told him what had happened to the old building, and he helped me push a heavy set of shelves in front of the already locked door just to make sure. Emma asked if we should call the cops. I told her they wouldn't help. We went upstairs and kept our eyes on the windows that looked over our backyard. Emma was freaked out and started asking what the hell was going on. Chris and I sat her down and began to tell her our story of when we found the butcher face tapes in Chris's parents' house. Her expression turned to shock when we described the content of the tapes and she slowly began sinking in her chair until we were done telling the story. She sat in silence for a moment, staring at the floor, appearing to take it all in. Then she slowly looked up and apprehensively asked, This man in the videos, is he missing two fingers? Chris and I both froze for a minute. How could she have known that? She went on to describe how, a few years ago, a friend of hers had shown her a DVD of the exact same footage that we had described. This friend had since moved to Colorado. We realized that she had watched one of the DVD transfers that Chris's brother had made back in college. What were the chances of me running into someone who had also seen the butcher face tapes? I asked her how many times she'd watched them. She claimed to have seen them five, maybe six times. Well, 
When we asked her where her friend had gotten the DVD, she said she had no clue. Our next inevitable question was if she'd seen Butcher Face for real, or if she'd had any other strange occurrences. The only thing that she'd be willing to say on the subject was, that's complicated. The conversation then switched to why he was following us again in the first place. I brought up the fact that he never seemed to leave Chris's family alone, even after the cabin incident. He got defensive and asked if I was implying anything. Even he had to admit that he'd been obsessed with Butcher Face before the cabin. I asked how the guy could go in and out of our house seemingly at whim. He yelled, BECAUSE HE'S BEEN LIVING IN OUR BASEMENT! YOU JUST SAW IT! His ex brought up the idea that maybe it was Jesse who became obsessed and Butcher Face had been following him this whole time. She made a good point that we didn't have any occurrences happen at our house until after that night Jesse had crashed into our tree claiming that Butcher Face was in his back seat. Maybe Jesse brought him here, knowingly or unknowingly. The problem I had with that was that we'd only seen Jesse a couple of times after the cabin incident, and he was largely absent when Butcher Face was tormenting Chris's family, and when Chris's ex had found the pictures on her camera. Also, after crashing his car, Jesse didn't have enough money to fix it or buy a new one. He hadn't been here in months. So even if Jesse had brought him here, why would Butcher Face seemingly abandon a good disciple and come torment us unless he had a potential disciple here, too? I also asked how Butcher Face knew where to find me and Emma at the old building. Chris claimed he didn't know. I then added that Chris was the one who wanted to go and investigate Butcher Face's house. Then he froze for a second, his eyes looking at me wide, and said, No, that was you. You were the one who asked for a camera. You were the one who told us to jump in the car and go look for the house. And even though you believed that those pictures were left to lead us there, you still wanted to go in. It was also your idea to stake out Jesse's place, the kind of thing Butcher Face does. I fought against that temptation, remember? That night in the cabin, I burned all that media and evidence that I had, and I yelled at him through the door. I let it go right then. That's a part of my life I do not want back. And I'm not an idiot. I used to go on the internet. Yeah, I found that little trilogy of stories you wrote telling what happened to us. Then, you encouraged people to write butcher face stories of their own. If anybody in this room is obsessed in spreading butcher face media, it's you. I froze for a second. I knew that was wrong. I just couldn't find a way to prove it. Th this new series of events had pushed what we thought we knew about butcher face out the window. I'm not obsessed. I just want to figure out the truth behind butcher face. Who were the other people that we saw in these pictures on Chris's ex's camera? What does Butcher Face want? Is he really trying to recruit people? Why? Why does he portray it through media? Is he trying to tell us something? Is there some kind of hidden meaning in those messages? Some kind of subliminal message? I mean, is he truly insane? Is he working for somebody else? Maybe he has some sort of higher purpose that we don't really understand yet. Maybe he needs help and that's why he's recruiting disciples. I, I don't really know why I typed all this out. I guess I just felt compelled. Compelled to get my presentation, my story, out there for everyone to see. So here we start to see all those connections, all those questions, and maybe it occurs to you, maybe it doesn't, that you need a strong drive to keep up with it all, to keep going, even when common sense will tell you that it's dangerous or wrong. Put all that together, and maybe obsession doesn't seem so unlikely. Stay scary, my wildlings. Stay cognizant of the dangers you pose yourself and make the most of your nights.